people, um, billions of dollars made in a nanosecond on Wall Street. Billions of dollars lost in a nanosecond on Wall Street. We see changes in social relationships. I can friend someone that I've never met before. Of course, the Pentagon may be worried if someone serving in the military friends someone in China using a Pentagon computer. We're seeing changes in the law. We see this tool being very useful for everything from DNA um, identity tracking to data mining. Imagine the show CSI without computers. But of course, computers are leading to new ripple effects in terms of criminality. Imagine explaining to your grandparents identity theft and what exactly that is. The point here is that, again, it's these ripple effects that make something notable. The final parallel that people make, I think, is an instructive one. They say it's a lot like the atomic bomb. That is, an incredibly cutting edge, even elegant technology, but also a genie that you can't put back in the box. The underlying point here is that we often want to focus on the technology itself when it's its ripple effects on society, on war, on politics, on business, on law that truly matter. Now, I'm someone who's interested in the war aspects of this. And so several years ago, I set out on a journey basically to gather the stories of anyone and everyone working in the fields of robotics and war today. So what's it like to design a robot? What's it like for the science fiction authors who are advising the military on what to build? What's it like to be a 19-year-old sitting in Nevada flying a plane that's over Afghanistan? What's it like to be the four-star generals in command of them? What about the politicians? So I interviewed every single civilian service secretary. How does it affect when and where we go to war? The opposite side of the coin. What do insurgents think about our robots? What do they think about you and me sending robots out to fight them? The war of ideas. How are journalists covering this? Not just in the US, but journalists in places like Lebanon or Pakistan. And then finally, the right and wrong of all of this. What do military JAG officers think about what's happening? But also, what about people at places like Human Rights Watch? And so, in essence, these stories are fascinating, but also important. But I think they illustrate these ripple effects that come out from this. And so what I'd like to do in my remaining time is basically walk you through these ripple effects that I think are interesting and particularly relevant to our field here. Now, the first of these, as you're seeing, is that the robotic revolution is not just going to be an American revolution. There is a rule in both technology and war. There's no such thing as a permanent first mover advantage. So quick show of hands here. How many people in this room still use your Commodore computer? How many have ever used a Commodore computer? OK, we got some. Same thing plays out in war. The British invented the tank. The Germans figured out how to use the tank better. And so a challenge is that the United States is very much ahead in military robotics right now, but we shouldn't be arrogant about it. There's 43 other nations out there that are building, buying, and using military robotics. Nations like Russia, China, Pakistan, Iran, as well as allied nations like Great Britain. For your work, this raises certain challenges in terms of the cross between intellectual property and counterintelligence. That is, if this is a field that is critical to American national security, then we will see attempts at stealing information and everything from design, but also how you actually interfere with everything from design to operation. And we're already starting to see nodes of that. Um, two good examples. One is a robotics company that a couple years ago went to the Singapore arm show, where they saw a clone of one of their robots being displayed for sale. Another d manufacturer described how they have five different dedicated cyber war campaigns against them right now. Now, in many cases, we are our own worst enemies here. You may have heard about the recent news that insurgents were actually watching the video feed that predator drones and other drones were sending down in Iraq. And this came out of three things. The first was the unexpected growth of this technology, going from using zero to 7,000 in a couple of years. And because of this, we have a mishmash of software, some of it proprietary, some of it not. The second aspect is that they knew about the flaws. They knew that this could be tapped into as far back as 2000. 
but we underestimated the pace of technology. So what it took very sophisticated technology to do in 2000 to watch this video feed, by 2009 required a $30 piece of software that you could download off the internet. It was software that was designed essentially for college kids to illegally download movies. And then the third part, our own arrogance. Again, we knew about the vulnerability going back to 2000, but as one defense official put it, we didn't think anyone in the Middle East could figure it out. Now, the point here is that this is not a huge risk in terms of people taking over controls of the predators, but it was useful to them. It was a lot like being able to listen in on a police radio scanner. They were getting information that we didn't want others to have. But what this illustrates is where we are headed down the road. That is, as we utilize more and more systems that are digitally controlled, that don't have people inside them, we move from battles just of destruction into battles of disruption, jamming, deliberately clogging the bandwidth, and even persuasion, where the intent is to seize control of the system and make it do something that the owner or the operator doesn't want it to do. That is, to co-opt and persuade it. Things like recode all American tanks as enemy tanks, or change the GPS coordinates of where you're going to send that um, JDAM bomb. But there's something broader here to think about in terms of the global situation. Where does the state of American manufacturing, where does the state of science and mathematics training in our schools have us headed in this revolution? What does it mean to be sending out more and more soldiers with hardware that's made in China and software that's increasingly written in India? Or to put it more broadly, what does it mean for American national security when the number of students with degrees in IT and engineering is the same number as we were producing in 1986, but since 1986, the number of students with degrees in parks, recreation, and leisure studies has gone up by 500%. What does that mean for us? What does it mean that we are one of the few high-tech nations that doesn't have a robotic strategy? One of the interviews I did was of a US Air Force officer who's stationed in Japan. And his role is to basically keep a track of global technology trends, particularly in unmanned systems. And this is what he had to say, quote, the Chinese are kicking our butts while we sit on our thumbs. But you can't just focus on states. Just like is what happened in software, Warfare is going open source. That is, this technology is not like an aircraft carrier, an atomic bomb, where you need a massive industrial structure, not just to buy it, but even to use it. A lot of the technology is commercial, off the shelf. Some of it's even do-it-yourself. The editor of Wired Magazine, for example, built his own version of the Raven drone, that hand-tossed drone that you saw the soldier using in Iraq and Afghanistan, built his own version for $1,000. A particular area of concern, then, is the cross between this technology that is, in essence, flattening and proliferating and the realm of terrorism. For example, during the war between Hezbollah and Israel, you had a non-state actor versus a state, but it didn't stop that non-state actor from being able to fly four unmanned drones back at Israel. Or we had another incident of a um, radical website that offered users the capability of remotely detonating an IED in Iraq from the comfort of their own home. And where we're headed soon is, again, advancing in this technology. So for example, roadside bombs are not always going to stay immobile by the road. They will be able to get up and move. Uh, one example of this is um, in Iraq, a team of US soldiers saw a skateboard rolling at them. One of them very observantly noticed the skateboard was rolling in the opposite direction of the wind. Basically, they turned a skateboard into a mobile IED. There is an app for your iPhone that actually allows users to control a drone that can carry a couple pounds worth of payload. And again, it's not just going to be kids that think this is cool to operate in this realm. And this leads to three trends I think we need to keep our eye on. The first is that it reinforces the empowerment of individuals and small groups against the state. I remember doing an interview with a scientist for DARPA who said that, quote, for $50,000, I could shut Manhattan down right now. 
The second is 